Uh, our next guest is uh, a virtual guest who we'll be having, on, uh, who we were lucky enough to record. And unfortunately, he was not able to join us today. Uh, this is Professor Robert Rosner, who is on the faculty of the Department of Astronomy, Astrophysics, and Physics at the University of Chicago. He has served as the Argonne National Laboratory's Associate Director for Physical, Biological, and Computing Sciences and as its chief scientist from 2002 until his appointment as laboratory director in 2005. His research, and this is very difficult to say, a lot of um, complicated words here. His research in general deals with theoretical physics, fluid and plasma dynamics, solar physics, and high energy astrophysics. His specialty is plasma astrophysics, which in layman's terms means the physics of the sun and the stars. In this context, he led the collaboration of, the, of Argonne and University of Chicago scientists who created the Center for Astrophysical Thermonuclear Flashes and directed the center from its founding in 1997 until 2002. The center develops simulations of exploding stars with computer codes that can be adapted for application into other fields, specifically into the field of nuclear energy and physics. So uh, we're going to be watching his recording, and I think he's going to be trying to respond to some of the issues that are being brought up here today. So uh, let me just start the recording here, and we'll, we'll let it run. I think it's about 20, 30 minutes. So Bob, thanks so much for giving us time today. So sorry you can't be here in person for May 5th, but before you take off, It'd be great to have you tell us what you think about nuclear energy today, nuclear power plants, um, one year and some months after Fukushima, so that our audience can hear from someone who's been very much involved in these issues as director of Argonne for seven years and heavily involved um, since then, too. So it's it's a pleasure. Uh, I am sorry not to be at your meeting. Uh, what's interesting, you asked me the question about how I think about these things, the simplest way to answer is the reason I'm not going to be here in Chicago on May 5th is because I'm in Vienna uh, at the PrepCon, which is the meeting preparatory to the uh, non-proliferation treaty meeting uh, that the UN will be leading. And you can guess what my interest is. I'm very much interested in non-proliferation. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I'm hugely sympathetic to uh, your aims in, in the meetings that you're running here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I'd like to do is maybe make a few comments about uh, Fukushima and how I see uh, the Japanese issue uh, in nuclear. Um, it, was, it was, to me, extremely interesting uh, to see the evolution of how much we know about what happened mm -hmm. since uh, the incident uh, last year. Initially, I think the focus was very much on the technical end, things that had not worked properly from the, te the technical end of things things that could have been done better, uh, perhaps flaws in, uh, in the design of the plant itself, uh, flaws perhaps in the way things were managed on site. Um, and um, I would say probably for the first uh, three or four months, that was largely the story that you would read in magazines uh, and newspapers. <clears throat> and I think most of us also felt that that was largely the issue. But since then, I think uh, we've learned things um, about what had happened that put the incident in a, in a somewhat different uh, context. And uh, the, the Japanese government had, in fact, uh, impaneled a, a group of people uh, uh, that, whose job it was not to point fingers uh, at who did what, or who did something wrong, but basically to establish causes to understand better what happened. And to me, reading what they had written a bit more closely than, I, than one usually reads these things, uh, it was clear that what is meant by communication is a much deeper thing than just somebody calling up somebody or not calling somebody up. That this ha had to do uh, sent with the central issue about advanced technologies that are dangerous in their management. So let me try to frame the, uh, the argument in the following way. You can ask yourself um, uh, whether a given society, given its technological development and its social development, 
uh, how ready it is to absorb a particular kind of technology. Now, in some cases, and nuclear uh, power is one of them, uh, the issue of safety and security go well beyond just the question of whether or not you feel secure on a plane. In fact, the uh, Carnegie Foundation for Peace has been uh, putting together a plan to ask the vendors of nuclear plants, so the folks that build them, to sign a compact, and I believe a very large number of the existing vendors have signed the compact, which in short says that uh, these companies pledge not to sell a nuclear plant to a country in which the IEA has basically said they're not quite ready for it. The reasons that are given, the criteria that are given for readiness are largely technical and technological. What's not said is what about the culture itself? And this is where we come back and circle back to Fukushima. One of the examples that's given in the report about lack of communication has to do with an aspect of the communication between the what you might call the first responders, the people that are on the ground at the plant, at the time of the accident, and the people that immediately went there once the incident occurred, and the management of TEPCO, the utility back in Tokyo. And what was that lack of communication? Well, it had to do with the fact that there is a general maxim about safe operations of complex and dangerous systems, which is that the first responders are in charge, and that there is nothing placed, no obstacles are placed to their judgment of what needs to be done right then and there. Why is that? Well, because presumably they are trained, and they know the facts on the ground, and they are trained to respond to those. What happened at Fukushima is that the first responders did understand that there was a problem at the plant which had some serious potential downsides. In particular, they wanted to vent the pressure vessels, and they were told by management in Tokyo not to vent, that the folks on site were correct because the venting would have released the hydrogen. And the lack of venting was clearly the proximate cause of the explosions, the eventual hydrogen explosions. One can speculate that the reason that TEPCO officials did not want to vent was the natural resistance of any management organization, especially in Japan, to do something that releases some degree of radioactive materials into the, into the air, into the environment. This is a particular issue, I think, in Japan. But what actually happened was that uh, the countermanding of the venting right early on, in fact, in the end, caused a release that was much, much greater than anything that would have been released if they had simply vented. Now, what does this have to do with culture? Well, it has to do very much, in my mind, with the culture that's prevalent in Japanese corporations can ask oneself to what extent in a Japanese company uh, is the flow of information and direction of instruction of what to do top down and bottom up. To what extent are individuals that are in the management chain, that are, if you like, at the bottom of the management chain, able, on the basis of facts that they are aware basically argue and countermand things that they're being told by senior management. So my view about nuclear power is I have to be fav in favor of it on technological grounds. But I think uh, when it's deployed, the level of care that you have to take on the organizational level is not like you do with coal or gas or any other kind of technologies. It is special. Now, one of the issues that always comes up when we discuss nuclear power is uh, nuclear power has an albatross hanging around its neck, which is, again, unavoidable, which is right from the beginning. 
it's been technology that's been intimately tied to weapons. In fact, the technology grew out of the weapons program, not the other way around. And what I mean by move us forward is a future where if we do continue to employ nuclear power, that we make sure that it's done in the appropriate way. And this is not just a technological issue. There are folks that focus on technology exclusively. I think that's a huge mistake. I think we also have to talk about the social consequences, the social environment, the cultural environment that the technology is deployed in, and these have to be taken into account. And this matters to all of us. This is not just a matter of saying, well, this is happening in some far off place. Nuclear accidents anywhere affect all of us. Um, so I think uh, one of the things that uh, that is a sort of technological truth about the world is that, uh, which is also a cultural truth, I think, they're tied together, is that um, uh, of the uh, six, seven billion people on this planet, uh, just about everybody would like to achieve a standard of living, a quality of life that's comparable to what exists in Western Europe, in the United States, North America in general, in uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and so on. That is a standard of living where, which is, I would say, let's call it comfortably middle class, that kind of existence, what we're used to. And um, probably the, the societies that are most prominent in going this direction uh, are uh, in Asia in the first instance. So of course, India and China come to mind. But in South America, uh, countries like Brazil, um, and um, an essential element of getting to that place that they want to go to is the use of energy. So one of the things that is, that is already happening, we're seeing it, is a sharp increase in the consumption of fossil fuels. So the question is, can this planet actually sustain a world in which we are burning fossil fuels, not only at the current rate, but clearly at rates that are going to be far in excess of what's going on today. And the question is, what alternatives do we have? For example, could we count on the renewables such as solar and wind? Now, in order for solar and wind to make a difference, a substantive difference in what we're talking about, not at the margins, you have to lick a problem that we have not been able to lick yet, and that is the storage problem. It has to do with the intermittent nature of both wind and solar, and the fact that the fluctuations on the demand side, in, the, in this case, could not be easily matched by the utilities with the fluctuations on the supply side. You could do it if we had some way of building industrial-scale storage facilities, batteries, flywheels, there are many, many ideas out there that are economic. Ultimately, something we have to recognize the fact that in the energy field, economics hugely matters, and that you're not going to force countries to use technologies that will basically price them out of the economic markets. That's not, it's just not going to happen. So where does nuclear fit in? Well, nuclear technology, by and large, is technology that's actually quite well understood. We've been at it for 60 years. And one of the things that has happened over the last 20 years is that while there has been very little building going on, in the meanwhile, on the R&D side, there's been a lot of work that's been done in building new generation, new designs, that are inherently much, much safer than the reactors, the designs, that we've dealt with so far. They have all sorts of interesting features, including uh, passive safety, that is, you rely not on, on uh, uh, the workings of automated technology, but actually on just simple laws of physics that we are quite sure will work. Um, to basically stop uh, the run runaway heating in a reactor. 
there are many such designs around, and for a variety of reasons, uh, um, it's been very they've been very slow to be adapted. The reactors that are now being considered uh, for uh, here in the United States, uh, for example, um, in Georgia, uh, these are reactors that are being built by Southern uh, utility in, in that area. There are Westinghouse design, which have actually these, uh, they are in this direction of uh, passive safety, they have passive safety features. These reactors are called the AP1000. And this is sort of the first generation of reactors where uh, the degree of safety is, re is really a substantial difference between them and what exists right now. So if you were to ask me, should we be building any reactors like the existing ones, my view is absolutely not. There's a lot of work that has to be done on the international sphere. First, in uh, going further than the IEA has gone so far in dealing with the absorption of nuclear technology uh, by various kinds of countries. The IEA currently is charged with uh, surety, that is, the securing of nuclear materials. And that has, the, of course, the history of the Non-Proliferation Treaty behind it. And it's directly related to the Non-Proliferation issue. And the IEA, in fact, has enforcement powers. It has reached back to the United Nations. IEA does not have these enforcement powers on the safety side. The other thing that needs to be resolved on the international front is uh, the fuel cycle itself. One of the issues that is out there is that, uh, to date, we have not been successful. Now, we are now talking about the world, not the US in particular, but we are the world we have not been able to establish a procedure by which uh, spent nuclear fuel, so the stuff that comes out of reactors once the fuel is consumed, is then dealt with in a systematic fashion. But all of them have the common problem of what do you do with the waste? The waste, of course, is a problem because the waste contains material that can be chemically separated and made into bomb material. So it's fissile material, maybe it's plutonium. And that is a problem. Uh, there are various ways of dealing with the spent fuel. Right. They, and there are fundamentally three things that you can do. Mm -hmm. Once through, which means it comes out, and you deposit it, and you forget it. Mm -hmm. okay, that's called once through. There is a so-called MOX cycle, mixed yeah. oxide mm -hmm. cycle, which takes the output, pulls out the plutonium, reforms it into fuel again, and puts it once through again to the reactors. When you do that, the second time, you can no longer reprocess mm -hmm. that material. You're stuck with it, and you have to put it in a repository. Mm -hmm. The reason that you might want to do that is that you do extract a bit more of the energy from the uranium. Okay? And the end result is really something that's basically inaccessible for weapons material. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to make. Uh, once you produce uh, uh, a spent mixed oxide, oxide fuel, you're basically stuck and you have to put it in a repository. Mm -hmm. The third way is, from the technical point of view, uh, I think a physicist would uh, call the sweetest solution. Uh, the reason is you, that's, it's the route where you basically extract as much energy as potentially is available in the fuel. Um, so that, that's a positive from the technical point of view. And the difficulty is that the tool that's used to do that, which goes by two names, and in fact therein lies the issue, uh, that reactor is called either a breeder or a burner. So it's a burner if you, the plutonium and the other actinides, the bad actors, are completely burnt in that reactor. The, these, react, these kinds of reactors, they're called fast spectra neutron, fast neutron spectrum reactors, excuse me, um, are capable of burning the, the fissile material down to, uh, to the point where what you're left with is uh, material that has uh, relatively low levels of, uh, of radioactivity. 
The problem is that, from the technical point of view, that reactor, with some refitting, can easily be turned into a machine that basically takes uranium-238, which is the non-fissile form of uranium. In fact, it's by far the most common form of uranium in the world, mm -hmm. which cannot be used for bombs, and turning it into plutonium, which of course can. In that role, these kinds of reactors are called breeders, mm -hmm. because they breed plutonium. Mm -hmm. okay. And the problem is, and the argument has been, that even though in the United States we don't view ourselves as proliferators, for us to perfect that technology would mean that once you perfect technology, if you think that you can keep it secret, the evidence we have is technology can never be really held secret. <laughs> Must all be tired by now. <laughs> I'd just like to make a few comments first, um, having heard Mr. Rosner's views. And in terms of problems um, relating to nuclear power, I believe Mr. Rosner indicated two kinds of problems, one mechanical relating to nuclear engineering and the other having to do with culture. Uh, in fact, I agree with him on identifying these two categories. Further, I agree with him that the response of the Japanese government and TEPCO in this matter was uh, blameworthy. But if, if we're talking only about the mechanical engineering aspect, my impression is that Mr. Rosner feels that it can be safe, is can be safe, and I do not agree with that. The plants that caused the accident in Fukushima were, to begin with, um, made in the United States by General Electric. These were uh, models designed by General Electric and cons uh, uh, constructed in Japan, and I believe that what's been demonstrated, at, at the very least, that there was, that there was a flaw in the design. And from, from what I understood, he does not approve of the, of the currently existing uh, reactors, but he does believe that the newer reactors can be safe. I myself think that it is foolhardy to place such hopes in nuclear power. And that's what I would like to talk to you about right now. Mr. Rosner was speaking on the presumption that the people in Asia and elsewhere would like to have a living standard uh, approximate to those in, in the places he named, and that, that, is, and that implies the, the need for greater energy. So the horizontal axis shows the number of the population and the vertical, the energy consumption per capita in that given country. So that, um, that spread that designates China shows the, no the population that China uh, uh, represents in terms of the world and, the, and next to it. Um, and, the, and its height indicates the amount of energy consumed per capita in China. え、チャイナの帯の幅が人口十数億人を占めしています uh, the people consuming the most energy in the world are the Middle Eastern oil producing countries, but their population is so low that they don't show up as a bar, but rather a line. This is the United States that's consuming the most energy in the world. That purple line, uh, horizontal line indicates the world average of per capita consumption of energy. Americans are expending four to five times as much energy as the world average and consequently enjoying the comfortable lives that you all enjoy. It's true also of the European countries and my own country, Japan, that we expend two to three times the world average and enjoy uh, very comfortable lives.
現在の世界を4つのグループに分けていく。一番たくさんエネルギーを使っている。これが一番たくさんエネルギーを使っている。この国々が世界全体のエネルギーの 75% を使ってしまいます。残りの4分の3の人々が残された 25% のエネルギーを奪われたエネルギーを奪われたエネルギーを奪われたエネルギーを奪われたエネルギーを奪われたエネルギーを奪われたエネルギーを奪われたエネルギーを奪われたエネルギーを奪われたエネルギーを奪われたエネルギーいうことを示したのがこの図です。インプットデータを私はここに入れてます。左の方にエネルギーが使えないで困っている国という一群が、ありますこの人たちが、私たちが、私たちが、私たちが、私たちが、私たちが、私たちが、私たちが、私たちが、私たちが、私たちが、私たちが、私たちが、私たちが、The average lifespan is about 30. Most of you in this room would have to be dead by now. Today, the people who are in this room are going to be dead by now. And what we see is that if per capita you have access to 40,000 kilocalories, then your average lifespan goes up to 70. 平均寿命は70歳を突破することができます。でも、それ以上にエネルギーを膨大に使うようなことをしても、結局、人間の寿命は長くなりません。つまり人間というのは70歳、80歳、70歳、70歳、70歳、70歳、70歳、70歳、70歳、70歳、70歳、70歳、70歳、70歳、70つまりこちらに私はエネルギー浪費国家軍と書いたのですが、そういう国々ではエネルギーを生きるためではなくて、ただただ自分たちの長楽的な生活を続けるために使っている国々がこちらです。And Japan, I'm unhappy to say, belongs in that group. And the USA goes even further. I don't think we can go on permitting this kind of injustice, and I think your country, the United States, has to seek ways to go living, expending less energy. I think we can go on permitting this kind of injustice, and I think your country, the United States, has to seek ways to go living, expending less energy. I said that if you can access to 40 to 50,000 kilocalories per person, then you can live up to 70, and that is the current level of energy expenditure today in the world. このような不均衡というのを是正してエネルギーを膨大に使っている国々の分を今使えない国々に分けていって一人一人当たり4万キロカロリーというようなエネルギー消費ができるのであればみんなが70歳を超えて生きられるというそういう世界なのですでもそれでもまだエネルギーを欲しいという人がいるかもしれませんし、安倍晋三さんもエネルギーを欲しいと言っていますので、そのためには安全な原子力を使おうというのが必要だと思いました。私自身も、もともとは原子力という夢を持って、人類の豊かに生きられるという原子力を使おうと思っていました。私自身も、もともとは原子力という夢を持って、I myself believed, as that newspaper article that I showed you earlier stated, that fossil fuels would disappear and therefore nuclear energy was the answer for the future. So, I think that the most plentiful source of energy in the world today is coal. The most plentiful source of energy in the world today is coal. The most plentiful source of energy. The square represents the amount that we know exists in the in the earth. But in order to to access that coal, you have to spend expend energy in that effort itself. You need money, and therefore, what we are actually able to use today is that blue square. でも技術が進歩していけば。But theoretically, as technology improves, that blue square could come to coincide with the boundaries of that white square. I don't think you know exactly what that represents, so let me put a small mark up there. 
私たちが1年ごとに使うと思うんです。単位とかめんどくさいので飛ばしていただいて結構ですが、えー、今現在のエネルギー消費で、現在の確認でいうと、それを見ると、それを見ると、それを見ると、それを見ると、それを見ると、それを天然ガスは30年ほど前まではほとんど資源として認められていませんでした。でも大変使いやすいということで、最近ガスが使われていると発見されて、今では石炭に一部資源だということが分かってきました。My guess is that、uh, outer white square is going to increase as more reserves of natural gas are found and will probably be comparable to those for、uh, the reserves for coal. そうすると天然ガスだけでも人類のエネルギー消費数百年分を支えることができる量があるということです。その他エネルギー資源としては石油であるとかオイルスケール、スタールサンドというようなエネルギー資源も存在しています。これすべて化石燃料と呼ばれるものが今並べた資格です。The, the この化石燃料がなくなってしまうから未来は原子力だと私は信じたし皆さんも今でも信じているかもしれないしロズナーさんも信じているかもしれないしそう信じているかもしれないように私には聞こえましたそう信じているかもしれないように私には聞こえましたではその原子力の燃料はこれだけですこれだけですこれだけです If you look at how small the supply is of uranium compared to the other sources, it is, it is really absurd to think that we, put, we cast the future of humanity on such a, a limited supply. What I've written here, what I've represented here, is only uranium 235, the fissile kind of uranium. Many people,、uh, experts, understand the limited、uh, supply of uranium 235, and, and including Mr. Rosner, and therefore the idea, the hope is to those who put their hopes in nuclear energy now are now turning to the normally non fissile form of uranium U 238 and trying to convert it into plutonium. But plutonium, of course, was the material、um, in the Nagasaki bomb. It is extremely destructive, powerfully destructive. And if we were to produce huge quantities of that for the sake of energy, it's, it's、uh, hopeless to think that we can preserve peace. And moreover, as long as whether we're using uranium or plutonium, as long as、um, the process we're relying on is fission, then we are doomed to be producing those huge amounts of nuclear waste that we saw earlier. We have no way to detoxify that material, and we certainly don't even know how, where to dispose of it. I believe that we, we have no business generating waste that we, we don't know how to dispose of ourselves. And for that reason, I, I feel that we, should, we have no business dealing with nuclear energy. What I've indicated here in the large square、uh, is the amount of energy directed by the sun annually. 1年ごとに地球にくれているエネルギーなのです。下に並べたこの四角はいずれにしてもこの地球という惑星が46億年の歴史をかけて Our sources that have been accumulated over the course of the Earth's history of 46 billion years, and human beings are self centeredly trying to use it up ever so rapidly for their own purposes. Um, I think that the only thing we can rely on is, in the end, Um, the energy that the sun provides us, and that what we need to be concentrating our energy on rather than harnessing our dreams to nuclear power is to see how we can harness solar energy without harming the environment. We want to talk about the cultural issue. I see so much capacity for denial 
at least in obviously Japan and in this country, that I'm trying to figure out alone, how can we fight this capacity for denial that the dangers are real? I understand that there's profit to be made and everybody wants to have his hand in the profit, but I think we've got a psychological problem as well. えー、大変難しいご質問だと思います、えー、この人間がどういう選択を It's a very difficult question that you've posed I think of course money is involved and denial are involved cultural and social issues are involved but to my mind the animal called human being has、um, demonstrated to us a quite wretched history to date だったように思いますしこれまで大変悲惨な歴史をずっと繰り返してきてしまいました。未だに原子力を選択しようとしている。Of course,、um, money is part of it, and I think this、um, the kind of discrimination, energy discrimination that I have pointed out here, I've tried to point out, is part of that problem. 大体なエネルギー差別の問題というのものもやはりあるんだろうと思います。And finally, perhaps you would call this a cultural problem. But what, I, what seems to me to be the case is that human beings have yet to figure out how they ought to live. Thank you. Thank you. My question is about the structure of nuclear science and technology education at higher education institutions.、Um, do you observe any changes of movement by scholars, students, or scientists in Japan to redefine the responsibilities and safety of nuclear science technology? It, it's also a difficult question. It is true, both in the United States and Japan, that there was a period when people wanted to、uh, cast the future of humanity, attach it to nuclear power. This would be in the 1960s and 1970s. There were many students, and I was one of them. And, nuclear, and many nuclear power plants were、uh, built in the U.S. and Japan and put into operation. And, and as for the forces that led to the operation of these plants, of course,、um, as we've heard earlier, since there was a, the intimate connection with nuclear weapons, it had to do with national policy. And, and clustering、um, shortly after that are the power companies、um, that are seeking profit. And around that cluster of groups seeking money, you had the cluster of scholars. Of course, the, the phrase that has become common in Japan these days is to call that、uh, whole entity the nuclear village. It has had overwhelming power. I have tried to fight that power for 42 years. But my, the, the, whatever strength I had is so minuscule in comparison to the power of the nuclear village that I have been able to accomplish nothing, and I stand before you today. Until March 11th last year, all they had to do was simply ignore whatever I had to say. After March 11th, however, the, the, the truth of what I had been saying has been demonstrated. I'm not happy about this. I think that it would have been far preferable if what I had been saying was false and that no nuclear accident had occurred. What's happened, however, is because of the accident, those who promoted nuclear power are now unable to simply ignore what I say. Um, to, to give you one example, there's a nuclear, a, an academy of scholars who work with nuclear energy. And the head of that group is a professor at Tokyo University named Mr. Tanaka. So there's, there's a, a nuclear safety agency or committee, and there's another committee that promotes nuclear power.
And there's a Mr. Omoto in the latter, that is to say, the um, uh, committee uh, charged with promoting nuclear power, and he uh, worked um, at the IAEA, that which came up repeatedly in Mr. Rosner's talk. And last year, at some point, this Mr. Omoto, who was on the committee for promoting nuclear power and worked at the IAEA, in Mr. Tanaka, uh, on, uh, contacted Mr. Koide and said that they wanted to hear his views. So I made an opportunity for us to get together. They listened to me, but if you ask me if they changed their views from having heard me, I, I unfortunately I have to say no, I'm very skeptical. I felt that by having contacted me and listened to my views, what they were engaging in was to create an alibi for themselves and to um, assist their, um, their, the process of writing up their reports of where they had gone wrong. However, I think it is undeniable that even the promoters of nuclear energy are beginning to change their views, and I think it's because of what happened on March 11th that I am able to stand here today and speak to you, and I very much would like to continue to make efforts that we make efforts to not waste this opportunity. Just, just one question. One question. <laughs> About two years ago, an acquaintance of mine who comes from the former Soviet Union told me that there is research going on to reverse radioactivity. Is anybody in Japan or elsewhere doing this that you know of? First of all, if you, if you burn uranium or plutonium, you absolutely cannot avoid the production of, of a radioactive fissile product. I would love to put the genie back in the lamp, too. As we saw in the first slide, that the Chicago pile started operating 70 years ago in 1942. Of course, people like Enrico Fermi, who were, in, uh, who, were who were engaged in that experiment, knew that, that it was going to emit terribly toxic substances. And that's the beginning of efforts to, to, uh, to see if you can't, in, in your terms, reverse the process. And that research has gone on for 70 years, and unfortunately, the, the solution has yet to be arrived at. And um, I, I'm sorry, as someone who's been um, um, handling these materials as a researcher myself, I hold myself responsible, too. And I have a very strong desire to, um, to extinguish this poisonous, uh, dangerous substance that I am partially responsible for with my generation. Unfortunately, I don't think there's an easy solution for something we've all been seeking for 70 years. If I can add uh, something to that, uh, there's uh, no way that we can uh, reverse the uh, radiation, but uh, there are lots of research uh, right now going on with uh, reversing some of the effect on the human body, especially with um, this effort of uh, NASA to go to other planets, uh, uh, because uh, during that time, uh, the astronauts are getting lots of radiation, which is the same effect. And so there's uh, lots of uh, researchers going on to try to, to reverse some of the effect of uh, radiation on the human body. Um, it is true that there's, a, there's been a great deal of research going on, how to, on on mitigating the effects of radiation on the human body, but the power of radiation over um, the organism is so overwhelming that there is no way that the danger can be reduced to zero. I think that the best solution is to stop 
emitting radioactive substances to pr stop producing them. ただし、放射線は生命体に対して圧倒的に大きな危険を持ったものです。ですから何がしか緩和できたとしても、危険がゼロにならなんてことは決してありませんし、一番いいことは放射線を出すようなものはできるだけ使わないということが私はいいと思